Welcome to the Simon Center. It's, I'm really glad that uh, you came numerous for a very good occasion. This is, uh, again, one more uh, event of the series of the De La Pietra Families Lectures, which uh, is uh, really wonderful. And here we have three members of the De La Pietra Families, uh, Barbara, Vincent, and Stephen, who generously fund uh, many of the activities and support many of the activities at the Simon Center. In fact, that's one of the reasons why this auditorium is called the De La Pietra Families <laughs> Auditorium. And so we are really grateful uh, for their support and uh, over the years. Now, I think that uh, you know, the, the, today's speaker, for those who are in physics or mathematics, is, uh, is an obvious case. It's one of these, uh, Charlie has so many awards and accolades that I'm not going to really bore you with the, the details. In fact, he's the recipient of the Fundamental Physics Prize in 2019. In a sense, he's someone who is, uh, you know, follows a great heritage in physics and mathematics of how to use topology into physics. I think the first one was probably Dirac, when he was describing the quantization of charts for mag using magnetic monopoles. Then you have people like uh, Yang, again, Wu and Yang were discussing about Chern, Simons. So uh, he comes in this uh, prestigious trail of people who actually use topology to understand physics. And this is probably one of the nice things about the Simon Center. You know, this is the thing that somehow the Simon Center tries to foster, to relate physics and mathematics at the deepest level. So without further ado, please, Professor Kane. OK, well, thank you very much, Louise. That was uh, a very kind, very kind introduction. Um, and it's really, um, it's really a pleasure to be visiting the Simon Center. I've been here um, all week. And uh, you know, it's, I'm having a wonderful, a wonderful time. This is a wonderful place. So again, you do wonderful things here. So. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you all for that. And um, is I want to tell you about some of the really amazing things that matter can do. Okay, and uh, you know, matter is what everything is made out of. Uh, can arrange itself in the most ingenious ways. And so, what I'm going to be talking about mostly uh, today um, are sort of electronic properties of matter and, and electronic materials. Um, and uh, so to sort of start off talking about electronic materials, I'm going to go all the way back to the very beginning um, and um, uh, introduce uh, Benjamin Franklin. Okay, now Benjamin Franklin, um, now I have to say, I, I come from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and uh, uh, Ben Franklin is a big deal there. We talk about him all the time. Um, uh, and so, so you know, forgive me for you know going on my Ben, ben Franklin rant here. But uh, of course, Ben Franklin was a, uh, a statesman, uh, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. But uh, but he was a real Renaissance man. Um, so in addition, <clears throat> in addition uh, to this, he was um, uh, a very accomplished uh, scientist. And uh, what uh, Benjamin Franklin, as a scientist, was known for is he did the first um, systematic observations um, regarding the phenomenon of electricity. Now, so electricity, this is the stuff that uh, uh, lightning bolts are made out of. Um, it's also the stuff that makes your socks stick together when you take them out of the dryer. Okay, so electricity is a, is a, uh, a ubiquitous phenomenon. And uh, so uh, Ben Franklin uh, did these famous uh, uh, experiments where he went out into a lightning storm uh, flying a kite. Now, um, I, my advice is to not do that. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing he didn't uh, kill himself. But um, uh, what he discovered is something truly amazing about the building blocks for matter of matter that 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 that, that we have in this in this in this world. So what he discovered is that there is uh, that matter has an attribute called electric charge. Okay, and and he realized that electric charge could be either positive or it could be negative, and that uh, like charges push each other apart, and and opposite charges, plus and minus charges, attract each other. Okay, and. Um, and so this realization is something very fundamental about the world we live in. Um, and, but he realized something else, that um, uh, there are basically two different kinds of, um, of materials. There are materials that we call conductors that allow electric charge to flow, sort of the way that water flows in a pipe. 
And there are materials that are insulators that don't allow electric charge to flow, okay? And so there's a fundamental uh, a dichotomy between these two different kinds of materials, okay? And so now this is a very fundamental, deep thing that he, he understood, but, but I wanna make a point that, you know, Ben Franklin, um, in addition to, you know, uh, you know, discovering deep, deep fundamental things, he was also a very practical man. And so he realized that by making this discovery, um, he could do something really useful, okay? And in fact, discovering this allowed him to invent one of the most imp important technologies of his day, which was the lightning rod, okay? And sort of, of course, a lightning rod is the way that you can prevent your house from burning down in a lightning storm. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, by having an electrical conductor uh, sort of short the, uh, short the electricity from the lightning bolt uh, uh, outside your house, okay? And so, uh, so this, to me, sort of epitomizes, you know, so Ben Franklin epitomizes to me what, what is best about science, okay? It can be fundamental, it can be beautiful, but it is also useful. Okay, and so this, this uh, you know, um, uh, interplay between being useful and being fundamental and beautiful is sort of what has driven the discoveries that, have had, that, have, that, that we have had in our understanding of what matter is made out of um, and how it fits together. Um, and, and boy, what a ride we've been on on the last 250 years, okay? Um, uh, um, you know, our understanding of what, of what matter is and what it, it, it can do has, is, is it, it's amazing, okay? So think of it, you know, uh, uh, fast forward 250 years to the present day, and uh, it's amazing what electronic materials can do. I mean, if you step back and think, it's magic, right? Everybody has a uh, computer, uh, you know, in their pocket, a powerful computer. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's amazing that this is possible. The reason it is possible is because um, uh, we have uh, our ability to uh, understand and control the electronic structure of matter, okay? And this deep understanding forms the foundation for all of these technologies that um, we've grown accustomed to in today's information age, okay? And so what I'd like to describe to you today is the fact that you know, our understanding of um, the electronic, the, the possibilities of what matter can do is continuing to evolve, okay? And, and there are new uh, principles that are emerging um, that uh, can form the foundations for new kinds of technologies for the coming century, okay? And so I'd like to ex explain to you some of these new electronic phases of matter, and I'd like to show you what they're useful for, and I'd like to show you that they're actually incredibly cool, okay? They're incredibly beautiful and, and um, uh, something that's really interesting to think about, okay? And so I hope I can convey that to you uh, during this hour. And so, so I wanna talk about phases of matter. So let me just try to describe to you in simple terms what a phase of matter is. I mean, so, so the most familiar phases of matter um, are the liquid and solid phases. So water, um, uh, you, you know, can either be a liquid if it's, if it's uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, liquid, or if it freezes, it can be a solid, okay? And there's something very amazing about this, because, you know, uh, uh, water is made out of pretty simple building blocks, okay? Basically water molecules, they're all kind of the same. But if you have lots and lots of water molecules, they can do, they can have completely different kinds of behaviors, okay? They can, they can either be a, a liquid that can flow or they can be a solid that's rigid, okay? And, and so just knowing what the, the, um, the building blocks are, that's only part of the story. Um, what's interesting is what happens when you have many, many of those building blocks and what their collective behavior, what kind of collective behavior emerges out of that, whether it could be a liquid or it could be a solid. It doesn't make sense to talk about a single water molecule as being liquid or solid, okay? It only happens when you have many, many of them, okay? Now, likewise, we can talk about the, uh, the liquid and solid phase of water. We can also talk about the, uh, the conducting and insulating phases of material. So, so, um, uh, so if you have a copper wire, a copper wire is an electrical conductor, and so that's one kind of 
uh, phase, electronic phase of matter. And the insulator that surrounds it, you know, it's surrounded by some you know, rubber insulator. And that does not conduct electricity. And so that's a distinct electronic phase of matter. Okay, and so, so uh, I want to be thinking about these kinds of uh, electronic phases and show you that um, uh, you know, uh, some very interesting ideas about that have emerged in the last uh, few decades. Okay, so, um, uh, so in order to get started with this, what I want to do is I want to first describe a little bit what the fundamental building blocks of matter are. Okay, so, and, uh, and so this is the physics that, um, that came into focus in the early part of the 20th century, okay? Around the turn of the century, um, this was when there was a, a revolution in our understanding of um, the structure of matter. And what emerged from that revolution is that uh, matter is composed of fundamental particles, um, and the most important fundamental particles for, this, uh, for these purposes are the electron, the proton, and the neutron. And the important thing is that the electron and the proton um, have an electric charge, plus and minus uh, E, okay? Um, and the, the, there's something very deep and important here. Every electron has exactly the same charge as every other electron, okay? And so, so what, the, what we say is that electric charge is quantized, okay? It comes in discrete units, which is the charge, with, which is the charge of the electron. And the proton has exactly the opposite a charge, okay? And um, so, uh, so, so this discreteness of electric charge is one of the most basic features um, of matter that we have, okay? Um, uh, actually, there, there's a little bit of a funny story about this. Um, you know, so I told you Benjamin Franklin, um, uh, he discovered charge, and so he was the one who got to decide uh, which one was the positive and which one was the negative. Okay, fortunate choice he possibly could have made. Okay, because the choice he made uh, made it so that the electron has the negative charge. Okay, and this fact is a source of endless confusion for introductory physics students who are trying to solve problems when they realize that an electric current goes this way, but the electric electrons are going this way. Okay, and so uh, so that's a problem. Um, but we're stuck, with, we're stuck with Benjamin Franklin's minus sign, and we have to just uh, sort of make do with that. So, um, so now, of course, uh, electrons and protons and neutrons, they arrange themselves into atoms. And you can think of an atom as being like a little solar system where the electrons are going around orbiting the, um, the, the nucleus, which has the protons and the neutrons, sort of in the same way that uh, the planets uh, go around the sun. Okay, and um, uh, so you know, this is sort of a picture of, of, of what is happening uh, in an atom. Um, but that picture is, is, um, is incomplete due to another one of the revolutions um, in our understanding that happened in the beginning of the 20th century, and that is uh, quantum mechanics, okay? And so, so uh, uh, and quantum mechanics sort of drastically changes the way we think of the way electrons can behave in atoms, okay? And, and, um, and the, the essence of what quantum mechanics tells you is that in atoms, electrons can only sit in atoms in sort of discrete quantized energy levels. And what that means is that the electrons in, in an atom, it's like they're snapped into place. Um, there's no, there's no, there's no uh, play in them. There's no room for them to, to sort of uh, you know, uh, uh, wiggle around. They're snapped into place, sort of the way that you know, if you snap Legos together, they're snapped in and everything is rigid. Okay, And so, um, uh, so these electrons are locked in place. In order to get them to do anything, you have to give them a, a, a kick that is big enough to sort of unstick them, okay? And, and so, um, so you, you know, and, and what we say is that um, the barrier to getting the electrons to do anything is what we call an energy gap, okay? And so if you don't, if you don't give it a big enough kick, then, then nothing happens to the electron. It just, it's just stuck. It's locked in place the same way that Legos are, are locked together. Okay, and now, so these facts um, actually allow us to understand the most basic electronic phase of matter, which is the insulating state, 
Okay? And so what, what an insulator is, is it's just a bunch of atoms. And so here are the atoms. There's the electron sort of going around the nucleus. And, and each, at, each atom, the electron is just snapped in place, so it's stuck there, and it can't do anything. Okay? And in order to get them to do anything, you have to give it a big enough kick. Okay? And if you don't do that, then everything is locked in place. The electrons are stuck. They don't do anything. So there's a sense in which this electrical... Actually, okay, it's minus. You have this fundamental charge, minus E, that can carry electricity. Um, but you could also do something else, um, which is you could remove an electron. Okay? And this is actually more interesting. Because um, if you think about it, this, this missing electron, so, uh, so whereas when I add an electron, I had a charge minus E, if I remove an electron, this missing electron has a net charge of plus E. It's like I subtracted minus E. And this missing electron, which is we call a hole, it behaves like a particle, too. Move, or the, the hole can move if the electron next to it moves over to take its place. And likewise, it can move again and again. Okay? So the holes are fundamental particles in this insulator, too. Now, you see, this is something that's new. Because, you know, the, 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 the actual uh, building blocks for this insulator were electrons and protons. There were no holes there. There's no positively charged thing that, that can move around. There's no, but but this, this missing electron behaves just as if it was a particle, but it is an emergent particle that exists only in this insulator. You can't, you can't take the hole out of the insulator. It doesn't exist any, you know, uh, anywhere else. Okay? So, um, so, but in any case, so in, a, uh, in this insulator, there are fundamental excitations, which are the char charge minus E electrons and the charge plus E, elect uh, plus e holes. Now, you might think that this could be kind of useful if you could add electrons and holes to an insulator and get them to conduct electricity. Okay? So in fact, a material that it is easy to add electrons and holes to, an insulator that it's easy to add electrons and holes to, is called a semiconductor. Okay? And semiconductors are useful, right? Um, uh, um, so silicon is a semiconductor. Okay? Now, the thing is, this, you know, this picture that I have, that I, you know, this is almost a cartoon-like picture. It's, it, it almost seems like it's too simple to be true. Right, um, you know this, this this understanding, and and so uh, so we have, um, uh, but real uh, semiconductors exist and are useful. And you see, it was one of the great triumphs of the quantum theory of matter that that developed um, over the course of the 20th century. Um, it was one of the greatest triumphs that we now understand the electronic properties of these materials in great detail. Okay. So, so a silicon crystal, so again, silicon is the semiconductor that is in all the computer chips in all of your electronic devices. Okay? And, um, uh, and silicon has a very specific uh, arrangement of atoms. It has a specific crystal structure. And it has a very specific structure to its electronic uh, excitations. Now, don't worry. I don't want you to worry about what all the curves on, what all the wiggles on this graph mean. Okay? The point that I want to get across is that it's kind of complicated. There are lots of details. Okay? But those details we understand pretty well. Okay? And, and by mastering the details of the electronic structure of this material, that has allowed us to, to harness these materials to do the useful things that we know how to make them do. Okay? So, um, so, uh, so the quantum theory of solids, this is, this is the foundation for, uh, for all kinds of electronics technology. So it's complicated, though. But you see, there's a point that I want to make, which is that it is complicated, but I want to argue to you that there is a sense in which the very simple-minded cartoon picture that I showed you, that, that, that actually is, is right also. Okay? Because you know, even in silicon, it's still true that the fundamental carriers of electricity are charge plus E holes and charge minus E electrons. That's still true. So somehow this cartoon picture gets that right. Okay? 
And so, um, so this leads me to, uh, to a very deep and uh, 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 beautiful uh, thing about physics, um, which is I want you know, I ask the sense in which it gets it right. And the way I like to say it is that um, theoretical physics uh, is kind of like an impressionist painting. Um, so look at this painting, you know, so uh, beautiful, beautiful painting. Um, uh, but if you look at it too close, if you go up and, you know, stand right next to it and look at it, then it, it's all wrong. It has all the details wrong. It's not, it's not a, it's not a uh, you know, faithful representation of what's actually, of, of reality, right? Um, uh, so, so it gets all the details wrong, but if you step back from it, and look at it, and you step back, then there's a sense in which it really does get it right. Okay, it gets something right. Okay, and I'd like to argue to you that theoretical physics is kind of the same way. Okay, so in theoretical physics, we can describe simple models. In detail, they're not they're not right. But there's a show you that um, you know uh, 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 understanding the sense in which it gets it right is a deeply aesthetic. Uh, experience, okay, and I'd like to try to try to share that uh, with you uh, a little bit, okay. And so, um, it, in order to explain the sense in which this cartoon picture, you know, gets gets the the essence of the insulating state uh, right, um, I want to introduce a very deep uh, concept, which is the concept of topology. So, topology is a a, a beautiful branch of mathematics. Okay, and, and, and what topology is concerned with is it's concerned with the study of objects that can be continuously deformed. Okay, so the, what I want you to have in your mind is think of a piece of clay, right? A piece of clay, you can squeeze it and mold it and stretch it, and, um, uh, and, and it, its shape can change continuously. Okay, and um, so what uh, topologists uh, are interested in is they're interested in what kinds of shapes can you smoothly deform into one another. And the idea is, is that objects are called topologically equivalent if they can be continuously deformed into one another. Okay, and so the classic example um, for thinking about this is to think about the sense in which a coffee cup is the same as a donut. So this is obviously a coffee cup. And this is obviously a donut, okay? But you know, if they were made out of clay, you can imagine you know, going through a series of steps where I just change it a little bit each time, okay? And, it, and I could imagine you know, very little happens at each step along the way. I can imagine doing it continuously. And, and uh, at the end of the day, I've turned the coffee cup into a donut, okay? So you can sort of see the whole, the, the, the handle of the coffee cup uh, has turned into the whole of the donut. Okay, and so, so a topologist would say that a coffee cup and a donut are the same. Okay, so, um, but, but that doesn't mean that everything is the same. Okay, so if you think about, instead of a donut and a coffee cup, you think about a sphere, the surface of this orange. Okay, so you could continuously deform that. You could step on it and turn it into a pancake. Okay, but you can't turn it into a donut without poking a hole in it. And that's something, that's a drastic change, right? You, you can't poke a hole continue smoothly, right? Because you have to go from not having the hole to having the hole instantaneously. And that's a, that's a, a, a you know, a, a drastic change, okay? And so, um, so the, the sphere and the donut are different. And so what mathematicians like to do is they like to come up with a simple characterization that tells you whether things are the same or whether they're different. And so, uh, you know, for the, for the sphere and the donut and the coffee cup, what you basically can do is you can say, well, there is what is called a topological invariant, um, which is an integer, it's a number, you know, one, two, three, four, that counts the number of holes, basically, and we call this the genus, okay? And, and, and this integer, uh, uh, you know, uh, cannot change continuously, okay? It has to change, uh, you know, abruptly, okay? So, um, so this, is, this is the idea of topology. And so you can ask the question, what does this have to do with, you know, this sort of seems like sort of abstract, you know, mathematical thing, you know, but what does it have to do with, uh, you know, electronic uh, phases of matter? So, but what I'd like to argue to you is that the sense 
in which um, this cartoon picture of an insulator and the real picture of you know, the electronic structure of silicon, the sense in which the cartoon gets it right is in this sense of topology. Okay, um, uh, and and so uh, the uh, uh, so what I want to state is that um, I can consider insulators to be topologically equivalent if I can deform one into another, keeping it an insulator the whole time. Okay, if I can smoothly deform one into another, and so so if I start with you know this complicated in sil silicon, this complicated insulator, I can imagine sort of smoothly sort of pulling the atoms apart, um, very slowly and smoothly, um, and making them get further and further apart. And when they when they get much further apart, then it's going to be much more like this uh, sort of atomic independent uh, uh, atoms. Okay, and so I can smoothly go from this to this, and and so there's a sense in which these two are the same. Okay, and the whole way along the whole way, the fundamental excitations are charge E uh, holes and charge minus E electrons. That stays the. So, um, uh, so you know, uh, uh, so so you know, so silicon is is complicated, and this cartoon picture is simple. Okay, so it's sort of like uh, if I think in terms of surfaces, you know, the um, the sphere is the simplest uh, surface that doesn't have any holes in it. Okay, it's very simple. And, and very beautiful, okay? Um, but, you know, surfaces don't have to be simple. They can be complicated. So if you look at, uh, this is Dave the octopus, and Dave the octopus has a more complicated shape, right? Um, but I don't think he has any holes in him, and so uh, uh, um, uh, his genus is zero as well, okay? So Dave the octopus is topologically the same as this sphere. He's much more complicated, okay? But, you know, maybe there are some things that are easier to think about for the sphere, okay? And that can uh, allow us to, uh, to get a deeper understanding of the more complicated shapes, okay? Now, um, now uh, 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 most insulators are kind of like the trivial insulator. So it's, so, it's, so it's as if, you know, so, so, so silicon is the more complicated case, but it's the same as the trivial insulator. But when you draw the picture like this, then this poses a very interesting question, okay? Which is, um, uh, uh, is there an analog of the donut, okay? So are there topological insulators that are not equivalent to the trivial insulator? So in pictures, is there an analog of the donut or the coffee cup, okay? Um, and the amazing answer to this question is yes, there are topological insulating states, and they're fascinating states of matter that have fascinating properties, and I want to I uh, uh, share those uh, with you. But, but I want to make a point that, you know, the, uh, the quantum theory of matter, you know, was developed in the, you know, early to mid part of the 20th century. It's been around for many decades, okay? Um, and no, people didn't really think to ask this question of whether, whether, whether there could be topologically non-trivial electronic structures. It wasn't a question that, that was on people's radar, okay? But in the last you know, few decades, this has been something which has, has emerged as an interesting idea. And once you, once you ask the question, then that leads you down a path of discovery where there are just amazing things uh, that, we've, uh, that we've learned. Okay, and so I want to teach you about some of these amazing things. So, so in order to introduce you to topological insulators, I want to give you the, I always like to come up with the simplest, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, example of a phenomenon that's simple enough that maybe you can get, get your head around uh, what's going on. And the simplest version of topological uh, insulating states that I can come up with is in a, uh, a one-dimensional polymer. Okay, so what a polymer is, is it is a, um, it's like a chain of atoms, a one-dimensional chain of atoms. So these black dots are carbon atoms, and they're sort of, you know, sort of a one-dimensional chain of lots of uh, carbon atoms uh, arranged along a line, okay? And there, there are also hydrogen atoms attached as well, but that's, that's not so important. What makes polyacetylene interesting, so polyacetylene um, uh, is an insulator, 
Okay, um, but it's a kind of interesting kind of insulator. It's an insulator, basically the reason it's an insulator is because what, what polyacetylene wants to do is it wants to have pairs of atoms sort of um, uh, bond to each other more strongly so that they get a little bit closer together and they're, they, they sort of pair up, pairwise, okay? And, um, and by doing that, that makes polyacetylene an insulator, okay? The thing that's interesting about this insulator is that there are two ways that you could do it, okay? Because this is an, you could either have, you know, alternate going, you know, strong, weak, strong, weak, or you could go weak, strong, weak, strong, okay? And so these, these are two different ways that polyacetylene could arrange itself, okay? And so I would like to argue to you that these two insulating states of polyacetylene are topologically distinct in the sense that I explained to you before, meaning that you can't get from, from, uh, from this phase to this phase without going through a state where, 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 um, where, where all the insulator is. So the, 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 um, the sort of impressionist picture that I want you to have in mind for what's going on here is that in, this, uh, in, in, uh, in polyacetylene, polyacetylene, so I told you that atoms are like, um, you know, they have these sort of, sort of places where the electrons can sort of snap into place like Legos, okay? But what happens in polyacetylene is that there are twice as many spaces as there are atoms. So the atoms sort of occupy every other um, uh, space, okay? And so in the A phase, this, 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 this version of polyacetylene, then the electrons are sort of occupying the blue wells here, okay? Whereas in the B phase, they're occupying the other wells, the red wells, okay? And so this is, so these are um, uh, what are happening, in, what's happening in these two distinct uh, topological phases of, of, of polyacetylene. Okay, so this is the picture that I want you to have. Now, an important thing about this is that, you know, I told you, you know, you elect, you know matter is made out of, you know, electrons and, you know, negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons. And, you know, um, uh, it, you know they're always, you know, they're always just enough electrons to balance the charge of the protons that are present. So overall, the whole thing is electrically neutral. I'm only drawing the electrons but you want, need to keep in mind that there are just enough positive charges so that, um, so that the charge is exactly uh, compensated, okay? Now, um, uh, so you could ask the question, okay, so, so what? What, 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 what consequence uh, does this have? Why should this uh, matter, okay? And so, um, so I wanna show you a magic trick, okay? So, uh, so here's my magic trick. Um, so I'm going to start with my uh, start with my uh, just you know nice chain of, of polyacetylene where where I'm in the A phase so I'm occupying the blue the blue uh, wells okay and again I want to emphasize this is a um, situation where um, it's perfectly electrically neutral there's just enough all the positive and negative charges exactly balance each other. Okay. And so now what I can do, you know, so uh, uh, actually the reason polyacetylene is, is, is important is, is because it's actually a conducting polymer. It's an it's a, it's, it's a insulator that you could add electrons to to make it conduct. So I'm going to add an electron to, the, uh, to, this, uh, to this, and so there it is. Okay. So I've added an electron, and so now um, I know that when I've added the electron, I have a sort of an extra electron. So, so, so now it's going to be an extra. There's going to be an extra charge of you know minus Benjamin Franklin's minus uh, times e. Okay. So I've added all the charge I'm going to add. Now I'm just going to rearrange things a little bit. So, watch this. So I'm going to move things. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move uh, these electrons over a little bit. Yep. There they go. And, uh, and I'll do the same thing again. Move these ones over. Oop. There they go. Okay. Now, so now I want to ask the question. What happened to the electron that I added? Okay. Now, okay, I know there's probably a wise guy in the audience that's going to say it's, it's, it's right there. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay, but, but think about this. You see, um, 
in the middle here, I told you that when I'm occupying every other space, I have just enough electrons to compensate the positive charges. Everything is electrically neutral. So there's no charge in the middle here. I can move, you know, I could keep doing this and move, move it further and further apart. Okay? There's no, there's no charge in the middle here. Where's the charge? The charge is here and here, where the electrons are kind of bunched together. Okay. So what's happened to the electron that I added? The, elect the, the, the electron that I added has split in half. Okay. Now, it's important, you know, so, so you know, over here it looks exactly the same as it looks over here. Okay. And I know I only have one extra electron, so it's got to be, the charge of this thing has got to be exactly E over 2. And this thing, it can move around. I showed, you, I showed you it moving. It moves around. It's just like a particle. Okay? But it's not a, but, but it's, a, it's an impossible particle, right? Because, you know, you can't cut an electron in half. And that's not what we're doing here. Okay? And um, so this is something, I, I think this is amazing. It's really cool and beautiful. Okay, and uh, I'm not the only one, you know. Um, so, uh, so John Preskill is a, uh, a very distinguished theoretical physicist uh, from Caltech. And um, uh, so in addition to being a physicist, he also moonlights um, uh, as, a, as a poet. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and, and when, he's, when he feels inspired, he, he often writes, writes, writes poems about, uh, about things. And so, uh, so, so, uh, uh, so Preskill learned about this um, while listening, or it's something related to this, while listening to a talk by uh, another uh, distinguished uh, uh, theoretical physicist, and actually a good friend of mine named Leanne Balance. Um, and so, uh, so he was inspired to, uh, to say it this way. Um, uh, you have to admit it's legit. Electrons can split. So, so there's, something, there's something very special going on here. So how is it that we can get this, this, uh, this, this half of an electron here? Okay. How are we able to break that fundamental rule that you can't cut electrons in half? Well, what's happening? So remember, we started off, um, and we started off in the uh, you know in the sort of A phase where the electrons were occupying the blue wells, and then when we separated them, the electrons in the middle, in between, are occupying the red wells. So this impossible half of an electron is occurring at the boundary between the two different topological states. Okay, and so this is the big idea about topological phases of matter. Okay, so um, topological uh, phases allow impossible things to occur at the boundary between different topological states. So I have the A phase and the B phase, and, uh, and on the boundary between them, I have this impossible charge E over 2. Okay, and so this is the essence of what topological phases of matter are about. Okay? And, I, and the point I want to make is that there are many, many more examples of this kind of phenomenon. Okay? And, um, and I want to I show them to you and explain to you um, uh, how interesting these, these, these topological phases of matter um, uh, uh, can be. Okay? And so the, um, the first example that I want to give you is motivated by a problem. Okay? And the problem is um, uh, you know, in electrical conductors, um, you know, the flow of electrons in electrical conductors is actually kind of disorganized, okay? The electrons are kind of bouncing around. It's sort of like, you know, you go to the theater and you come out after, after the show's over and, and there's a huge crowd out in the street and you're bouncing into people trying to get to the subway, you know, and, and you, you're having a hard time getting where you're going. And, you know, um, uh, that's sort of how electrons feel when they're trying to flow in an electrical conductor. Okay, and so think about, and, and this is a problem that gets worse and worse the smaller and smaller you try to make your little electrical conductors. Okay, and so this is the problem, you know, in, you know, for the, you know, so in your electronic devices in your pocket, there are all kinds of little wires connecting, you know, that electrons are trying to flow down. And, um, and it's a real problem that uh, the smaller you make it, this problem of, 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 of having the electrons be too crowded and have trouble getting where they're going, that problem gets worse and worse. Okay? 
So is there any solution to this problem? And so what I'd like to do is take a cue from uh, how you would think about uh, organizing traffic, you know, and, and uh, one way of making things flow more smoothly is to introduce a divided highway for your, um, for your electrons, okay? And uh, because on a divided highway, the flow is much more organized, okay? So everybody's going the same direction and nobody's crashing into the people uh, going, the other, going the other way. Okay, and so, uh, so the question is, can we do, do uh, for electrons what we can do for traffic? Okay, and so what I'd like to show you is that with a topological phase of matter, this is indeed possible. Okay, and so, uh, and the, so the topological phase that can accomplish this is sort of the mother of all topological phases. It's the one that we understood first and it's the one that we understand the best, okay? And this is called the, um, uh, the quantum Hall effect or the quantum Hall state. And what the, it, it is what I'll call a two-dimensional uh, topological insulator. So what I mean by two-dimensional is that it's, it's, it, it's composed of electrons that can only move in a plane. It's sort of like a piece of paper, right? A piece of paper is two-dimensional, um, and the electrons can only sort of move, move within this piece of paper. Okay, um, and um, so uh, um, uh, and but and 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 on the inside of this piece of paper, it's it's a electrical insulator, meaning the electrons are sort of locked in place. They're stuck. They can't do anything. Okay, but this is a special kind of insulator that is distinct from a ordinary insulator. And it turns out there is, a, there is a, an integer that is sort of like the integer um, uh, that, um, uh, that counts the number of holes you know, in the donut, okay? sort of like the genus. Okay? And that integer um, uh, 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 tells you that um, uh, uh, there are going to be, if the integer is n, then there are going to be n lanes of one-way electrical conductors on the boundary. Okay? So it's just like a divided highway. Now, now uh, actually, there's so one point I want to make. This integer, so this integer is actually a, uh, a very fundamental um, uh, topological invariant that is known in topology, and it's called the churn, uh, it's, it's called the churn class. Okay, and so the mathematics that goes uh, uh, that, that one uses to describe this churn class. So this is actually mathematics that uh, that Churn and Jim Simons invented. So so talking about this here at the Simons Center is uh, is quite a uh, quite a privilege. Okay, now um, but but these uh, the consequence though of this is what happens on the boundary. Okay, and you have this one-way electrical conductor, and th these one-way electrical conductors are amazing. Okay, because you know, imagine that you're an electron. Okay, so think think of it. You're you're an electron, and you go into one of these states. Then you have no choice but to go forward. That's the only thing you can do. Okay, there's no way you can turn around. It's like there are no there are no cars turning around on the interstate. Right, they, you just you have to go forward. Okay, now. Um, uh, um, uh, so, so these are, and, and so that means that the transmission of electric charge in these in these uh, in these one-way states is perfect. Okay, you put an electron over here, you know with a hundred percent certainty it's going to come out the other end. Okay. Now, if you could have just one of these by itself, okay, let's imagine you just had one of these one-way streets for the electrons. So if you could have that by itself, so it's sort of like a one-dimensional uh, system. Now, okay. If you could have that by itself, then think of what you could do with that. What you could do is you could put the entrance to this uh, one-way street inside your refrigerator, and you could put the exit to this one-way street outside your refrigerator. And then you'd have a way you could run your refrigerator without having to plug it in. Right? Because, because these one-way streets would carry heat from the inside to the outside, and that's what a refrigerator has to do. You're, you're constantly pulling heat out of, the, out, of the, out of the refrigerator to keep it cold inside. Okay? If you could do that, you'd be rich. 
right? Um, uh, because you'd be able to solve all of the world's energy problems. Everything would be perfect, right? Um, uh, um, but there's a problem. Um, if anybody tells you they can, uh, they can uh, do that, um, then uh, that uh, would be fake news. Um, uh, because it's impossible, okay? Having one of these by itself um, violates deep principles of physics, okay? Um, and so there's no way that you can get this, um, uh, get this to go uh, by itself, okay? So, uh, um, uh, but you see, it's impossible. But what this topological phase, this quantum Hall state, allows you to do is it allows you to have this impossible thing on the boundary um, of this topological phase, okay? And, um, and that means that, you know, in addition to being impossible, once you have it, you could peel it off, then you'd have it by itself, and then you'd be rich, right? So there's a, so, so, uh, um, so, so once you have it here, it has to be there. You can't get, it's topologically protected. So um, now, I'm telling this story a little bit backwards. Um, uh, so the quantum Hall effect um, uh, was not discovered you know, by people sitting by themselves thinking about you know, donuts and coffee cups and things like that. Um, that's not how it happened. Uh, the quantum Hall effect was actually discovered uh, in the laboratory. Okay? And so this, this is one of the great discoveries of the late part of the 20th century, um, uh, which um, started with um, Klaus von Klitzing. And um, so at the time, in the mid-1980s, um, uh, what von Klitzing was interested in doing is studying the fundamental properties of semiconductor materials, okay? Studying the fundamental properties of the materials that, 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 that were being developed at that time and are now, uh, you know, uh, components in your, in your cell phone, okay? And, um, and so he was doing sort of fundamental characterization of these materials, and what he discovered is that when he put them in a big magnet, which is one of the ways that you characterize the electronic properties of materials, you measure, you measure the you know, conductance as a function of the magnetic field, what he found was that the resistance exhibited these, 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 these steps on which the, uh, the, the conductance was incredibly um, uh, accurately uh, quantized and so and it, so it's quantized as um, in terms of this combination of fundamental constants. So this is Planck's constant and the charge of the electron. Don't worry about what those are, um, but divided by an integer. And so one way of saying it is that by measuring the value of the resistance on this step, you could you know if you know the fundamental constants, then this integer you measure it to be one point zero 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 you know you know with nine zeros, one part in a billion. Another way of saying it is if you believe the integer, then what you're doing is you're measuring these fundamental constants, uh, this constant h over e squared to nine digits of accuracy. okay? This is amazing, okay? you know because you know it's not like it was a perfect experiment. Okay, this, this is a picture of, this isn't the actual uh, 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 von Klitzing's data, but this is a related thing. And look at it, it looks like a piece of crap, right? I mean, there's all these little globs of solder on it. It's not, you know, it's all dirty. It's not a perfect sample, but somehow it has a virtually perfect electronic resistance. Okay, so how could that happen? And so at the time, you know, people thought, you know, wow, you know, why on earth is this going on? Okay, how could it be that it's so perfect in such a crappy sample? Okay, and so this was the beginning. Um, and, 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 and geniuses in theoretical physics, people like Bob Laughlin, David Thales, and, and, and others. So this is, this is sort of multiple Nobel Prize physics, I should say. Okay, and, and, and so this inspired the geniuses in theoretical physics to think deeply about what was going on, and what emerged from that deep thought is the idea of topology. Okay, and so the, the understanding that emerged is that this integer that is being measured here to nine digits of accuracy is actually the topological invariant. 
And you see, the topological invariant, you can't mess it up by, by, by making it a little bit dirty. Okay? It's robust to those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of things. So even if it's not perfect, even if it's more like uh, Dave the octopus than the sphere, it's still perfect. Okay? So, um, so this was the, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, the quantum Hall effect. Now, you might think that these edge states, you know, these, these one-way conductors, you might think that could be pretty useful for, you know, organizing the flow of electrons in your tiny electrical devices, okay? The problem with it, though, is that, um, uh, you know, in order to get this to go, you need to put it in a big magnet, okay? And so this magnet, is a magnetic field is like, you know, you know, several Tesla. You know, Tesla is a really big magnetic field. You need a big, strong electromagnet to get, um, to get a Tesla magnetic field, okay? Um, which means, and you don't want to have to carry that around with you in your pocket, okay? So, so the question you can ask, is there some way you could get this to go um, without having to have such a strong uh, electromagnet, okay? And this is actually a hard problem. It's something that people are trying very hard to do. Um, and one of the ways of topological state of matter called a topological insulator. Okay, and so I want to introduce you to a topological insulator. And, and so what a topological insulator is, the way I like to say it is a topological insulator is sort of like a uh, chocolate treat that is uh, wrapped in tinfoil. Okay, in the following sense that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the chocolate on the inside is the insulator. Okay, and there is, you know, so the, the, uh, the electrons are sort of snapped in place. They can't, they can't do anything on the inside. But on the surface, it is an electrical conductor. Okay. Now, this analogy is a little bit, um, a little bit misleading, though, because uh, actually, um, uh, if you, if you, uh, it, it would be a very frustrating chocolate treat, okay, because, it, because it's impossible to unwrap it. You see, you see, if you tried to cut it open, what would actually happen is it would still be wrapped, okay? Because this conducting surface has to be there. You see, you see, this conducting surface is another example of an impossible thing, okay? So, um, uh, uh, so the, this this conducting surface has a very specific property, and I don't want to get into the technical details of what this property is. But in the lingo of our field, what we call is we say it has a single Dirac cone uh, on on its in its surface electronic structure. And the thing about that is is that that is impossible in a in a in a in a purely two dimensional system. Okay, and so what that means is that it's impossible to unwrap it. Because if you unwrap it, then you'd have the wrapper by itself. But I, I told you that the wrapper by itself is impossible. Okay, and so, so that means that this, uh, this, this conducting surface is topologically protected in the same way that the edge states are topologically protected. You know, these, these one-way edge states are topologically protected. You can't get rid of them, okay? And so, um, uh, so this is, uh, so this topological insulator is, is, a, is a phase of matter. <clears throat> and um, now, you know, I told you the quantum Hall effect that, you know, the way the quantum Hall effect was discovered, it was discovered in the laboratory. And then uh, that, you know, inspired, you know, geniuses to think about what was going on. And then some understanding uh, emerged from that. Now, the story of topological insulators is actually a little bit different. Um, uh, so topological insulators were actually uh, discovered by thinking about it, okay? <clears throat> and, and so the path to this discovery was, was first, you know, thinking about, you know, as a matter of principle, um, what, is, what might be possible, okay? And what, what we realized, I played a little bit of a role in this, but um, uh, what we realized was that it's possible to have topological structures of of you know three dimensional crystals of material, okay, and 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 um, and and it was it became possible to predict specific three dimensional crystals that should exhibit this effect, okay, and so so we started with uh, you know it started with some theoretical prediction. Now, if that's all we had done, then it would have been kind of interesting, okay, but not that interesting. What made it really interesting, though, was that the whole thing came to life 
in the real world. Okay, and so what was required for that was it was required to actually make the materials. Okay, um, so you can grow high quality crystals of this material. The best one, one of the best ones is a material called bismuth selenide. So it's a crystal composed of bismuth and selenium atoms arranged in a particular crystal structure that they like to go into. And it has a particular electronic structure which, um, uh, which we can deduce is topologically non-trivial. Okay, and so the prediction then is that this crystal of bismuth selenide should be an insulator on the inside, but be this special kind of conductor on the outside. So then, once you have the crystal, you have to have a way of, of, of telling what you have. Okay, and so basically what people did is they learned how to take a kind of a fancy picture of the surface of, of, of this crystal, and the, 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 the method that they use is a, is a method called uh, photo emission spectroscopy, but it's basically what that is, is taking a fancy picture of the surface that tells you about what the electronic structure of the surface is. And so this is what that experiment showed, and what, I'll just tell you that what, what is shown here um, sort of uh, uh, is exactly the single Dirac cone that, uh, that is, the, is the defining characteristic of this, uh, of this impossible surface state, okay? And so this is something that really um, happens in the, uh, in the real world. Okay, so these are topological insulators. Now, <clears throat> um, before I finish, I wanna introduce you to one more uh, uh, kind of topological phase, one more version of splitting the indivisible, okay? And uh, um, uh, in order to introduce this, I wanna, again, motivate it by a problem. Okay, and the problem uh, I want to motivate is the problem of uh, making a quantum computer. Okay, now making a quantum computer is one of the grand technological challenges for our era. Okay, I don't know if it's going to be possible in this century. It might be. Um, I've, one of the things I've learned is not to be too pessimistic um, uh, because things come up that you don't know are going to happen. Okay, but uh, let me try to explain to you what a quantum computer is and, and why it might be useful, okay? So uh, an ordinary computer, you know, the kind of computer you have in your pocket or on your desktop or laptop, whatever, an ordinary computer, um, what that does is it, it, um, it processes classical information. And the classical information are just numbers. Okay, and the numbers, the way a computer stores numbers is it stores them in terms of bits, which um, uh, are either equal to zero or one. So you can sort of think of it as like a switch that's on or off. If it's on, it's one. If it's off, it's zero. Okay, and so the thing about bits is that you can string them together to make the binary digits that can encode any number. Okay, so like the number five, you can write in its binary representation, it looks like 101. So it's basically one times two squared plus zero times two plus, plus one. Okay, that's what five is. Okay, now, um, so, so with n of these bits, you can encode any n digit binary number. And so what a computer does, basically, is it's a device where you give it some, some sequence of bits, and then it does some operation on them, and it spits the answer out. Okay, here I did something simple. I added two to it, and so I got another string of bits, which uh, can, you know, did, went from five to seven. Okay, now, um, uh, so, so, so let me tell you what quantum information. Now, so this is about quantum mechanics, and, and quantum mechanics has this this very mysterious feature with it, which is that if you have a bit, which I can think of as a switch, it can be either zero or one, then what quantum mechanics allows is for this bit to be zero or one or both of them at the same time. Now, um, don't expect to understand this, okay? Um, you know, uh, I don't understand it. And I don't think anybody understands it. That doesn't mean we don't understand quantum mechanics. The rules of quantum mechanics are very clear, okay? And the rules state that this is possible, okay? Um, but what it means is that's a, that's a, that's a much more difficult uh, question that I, have, that I don't have a good answer to, okay? But it is a fact that, um, that when you have something that can exist in two distinct states, 
quantum mechanics allows them both to be present at the same time. Okay. So now, so you so that means you can have a you can have you know your your quantum bit or qubit we call them. It can be zero or one, or it can be zero and one at the same time. It can be both numbers at the same time. So now think of what would happen if you had a string of n of these uh, qubits, a whole bunch of them. Then you can encode all of the numbers at the same time. Okay, all two to the n of them. I wrote down for n equals three, there are eight, you can go from zero to eight, you know, zero to seven. Okay. Um, uh, and so now, what a quantum computer is, if you could make one, is it would be a device that does operations on qubits. So you send, it, you send a uh, qubit in and it spits out an answer. But now, you know, if you send in this state that has all of the numbers in it, then you send it in and you get out all of the answers in just one shot. Okay? I think if you wanted to do that with a classical computer, you'd, you'd have to run it for all of the different numbers. You'd have to run it two to the n times. Okay? Um, whereas somehow with the quantum computer, you get them all in just one shot. Okay? So I hope you can see that that uh, computer is much more powerful than a classical computer. Now, now, if you think this is too good to be true, um, you're right. It is too good, too good to be true. Um, so there are, there are subtleties that make it so it's not quite this good. Okay? But it is still good, okay? and so it is a fact that there are classes of problems that a quantum computer can solve much faster than a classical computer. Okay? And so that fact is a motivator for us to try to actually make a quantum computer. Okay? Now, the problem is that that's a really hard problem, and there's a, there, and there's a reason for that. Um, so, so the problem is, so there's a fundamental difficulty, which is quantum information is extremely fragile. Okay? So, you know, we have this, you know, this combination, you know, where it's, where it's, you know, zero and one at the same time. But if you looked at it, you don't see the combination. You don't see it both of them at the same time. You see it's either one or the other. And which one you get is sort of like flipping a coin. Okay? And, but moreover, after you looked at it, it's not in the combination anymore. Okay? You've destroyed this quantum superposition by, by, by measuring the state. Okay? So the difficulty is that you know, if you want to measure a qubit, you have to kill it. Okay? Now, so this points to a in a practical difficulty for how you make a quantum computer. And the question is, how, you know, it doesn't have to be a person that measures it. Okay? How do you keep the quantum computer from accidentally measuring itself and, and killing all of the uh, quantum information? Okay? This is a really hard problem. Okay? Um, it's called the decoherence problem. And so there, there are different ideas for how you might get around this. One approach is to have your qubits which are just really um, uh, well isolated from everything else, so that they, they don't interact with anything else, and so nothing can look at it to measure it. That's one approach. That may end up being the best approach. What I want to tell you about, though, is another idea for protecting the quantum information that takes advantage of a topological phase of matter. Okay? And so this is, so I want to say, and I'll call this a topological qubit. Okay, and the uh, and so the idea, you know, so we have this qubit. It's a you know indestructible, ind indivisible object. What I want to argue is that there exists a topological phase that can split it in half. Okay, and so the idea is to split the qubit. Okay, and so the topological phase that can do that is called a uh, topological superconductor. Now. I don't have time to explain to you what a superconductor is, let alone what a topological superconductor is. But let me just say that the way we think about topological superconductors is very similar to the way we think about topological insulators. It's very similar to this uh, polyacetylene example um, that I showed you. Okay, so the, the, those those ideas uh, show up again um, uh, when when thinking about topological superconductivity. And so the idea now is that um, this topological superconductor splits the qubit in half in the same way that I split the electron in half. Okay? 
Half of it's at this end, and half of it's at this end. Now the beauty of this is that if you can only do a local measurement, you can only look at one place at a time, and these could be far apart from each other, okay? If you can only look at one place at a time, then it's impossible to measure the state of that qubit, okay? In order to measure the state, you have to sort of look at both of them together. Okay, and so if you can get them far enough apart so you can only look at one of them at a time, then it's impossible to measure the state, which means it's impossible for the computer to accidentally measure it. Okay, so the, topo so the quantum information is topologically protected. Okay, so that's the big idea. Okay, um, and so, uh, so this idea has motivated um, uh, you know, um, us to try to develop the technology for making these topological superconductors. Okay, now even that is a really hard problem. Okay, but it's a problem where we've actually made some progress. And uh, so, so where we are right now is there are certain, um, there, there, there are several different kinds of ideas for how you can make this uh, come about. And one of them is to take a kind of, a kind of wire. It's made out of a semiconductor called, you know, indium antimonide. Um, and it is that there's this half of a qubit that lives at the end, okay? And people have done experiments um, where uh, they sort of look at the end and they see this peak here, which is exactly what you would want to see if this half of a qubit, which we call a Majorana end state, if it's exactly what you would want to see if this Majorana end state uh, was there, okay? Now, um, you know, it's not a done deal. Um, people are still arguing about whether this peak is the interesting, you know, the explanation of this peak is the interesting explanation, which is that it's a Majorana state, half of a qubit, or whether it's some less interesting uh, uh, origin for the peak that they see, okay? But this is sort of, uh, this experiment has, um, has, has spawned a whole um, a field of, of, of inquiry, and I think it's looking pretty good. Um, uh, and there are, there are actually many other um, different kinds of systems that people have developed that where they see similar kinds of uh, uh, things. And, and so it's really, um, I think this is very promising. Okay. So, uh, so this is, uh, you know, uh, I've given you a bunch of different uh, versions of, of this splitting the indivisible um, uh, and making topological phases. And so let me just close. I'm, I'm just about finished. And, and I want to leave you um, with a thought. Um, which is, you know, so one way of thinking about physics is that, you know, you can think that the, the goal of physics is to understand the structure of matter at its, at its most fundamental, okay? What are the fundamental building blocks that matter is made out of? And what are the rules that govern how those building blocks interact with each other, okay? So that's one, that's one um, sort of direction that you can go with physics, okay? But there's another direction, which I want to argue is just as fundamental, which is to ask, once you have those building blocks, what can they do, okay? What can you make out of, out of, out of, out of all of the building blocks that you have, okay? And so I've, I've, hoped you, I've, I've shown you that, that there, there are new ideas for what, how, how to think about that. And, and so the analogy that I want to give you is, um, is you know, think, think back to you know, classical mechanics. So you know, you know, uh, Newton's laws of classical mechanics, what we teach our you know, beginning uh, physics students. You know, so Newton wrote those down in the 1600s, and he basically got it all. F equals ma, that was all there was to say, and that completely solved all of classical mechanics. Okay? So there's a sense he had all the, you know, he had everything there. Everything's contained in that, in, 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 in Newton's three laws. Okay? But um, it wasn't until, you know, 200 years later that the idea of energy emerged as an organizing principle for thinking about how matter that obeys Newton's laws um, uh, behaves. Okay, and of course now, you know, energy is, is sort of a defining, um, uh, you know, principle uh, un that underlies all different, not just physics, but all different kinds of uh, uh, branches of science. Okay, and so what I'd like to say is that quantum mechanics is sort of a similar kind of thing, you know, so the, the, the basic foundations of quantum mechanics, 
you know, the Schrodinger equation, all, all of that, that was sort of settled in the, um, in the beginning of the 20th century. And that's, that stuff is still right. It's still, it's right in the same way that Newton was right, okay? But, you know, uh, even today, organizing principles for how to think about quantum matter are still being uncovered, okay? And so, so this is a very exciting time uh, to be uh, a physicist because there are many interesting things, being new ideas, new materials that are, that are, that are uh, being developed. And it's a very exciting time because, um, because matter uh, can arrange itself in the most ingenious ways. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Is there any question or comment? Yes. Um, this is just a daydream. Is, do topological conductors or topological insulators have any relevance to molecular biology as far as you know? Oh, uh, well, uh, not as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the of the indivisible reminds me vaguely of the notion of the square root of minus one. Well, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, um, th there is a connection there, okay, um, where uh, there is, there's been a, a strain in physics of constantly trying to divide, you know, split things apart. And one could say that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, so physicists started with... Um, uh, you know, so taking square roots of things is sort of like what we're doing. So, so if you start with the, um, uh, the equations that describe um, uh, 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 electromagnetism, uh, it's, it's something called the Klein-Gordon equation, okay? And one of the f a famous th physicist named Dirac um, was trying to combine um, the theory of quantum mechanics with the theory of relativity. And what he ended up having to do is take this Klein-Gordon equation and take the square root of it. Okay, and what he ended up with was called the Dirac equation, and, and there's a connection between this process of taking the square roots of things um, uh, and and uh, and 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 getting new new physical principles emerging from that. So there is there really is um, a connection there that you put your finger on. It's a very 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 uh, a deep point that you're making. Yes. Yes, so the Nobel Prize um, uh, two years ago was given to uh, David Thaulis, who, um, who sadly um, uh, just passed away um, a, a month or so uh, ago, um, and uh, Duncan Haldane and, and, and David Kosterlitz. And um, so this Nobel Prize was, um, was, was for work that really uh, laid uh, the theoretical foundations for, 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 for much of what um, I talked about. In particular, um, this topological invariant that I told you described the quantum Hall effect, this integer, which I told you was a churn number. Um, so, so, of course, this was known to the mathematicians for, 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 for a very long time, but it was David Thales who recognized that the churn number is the integer that is measured in the quantum Hall effect. Okay, and so, so, uh, so that, that is one of the things that David Thales got the Nobel Prize for. Now, there's also other, other, other things which are related to t uh, applications of topology and physics that, uh, that, that Kosterlis and Thales were, were recognized for. But, um, but one of the things that Thales was recognized is precisely um, this, this, this insight. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Is the quantum Hall effect also an induced, uh, induced effect, such as the normal Hall effect in the conductor? Well, it's induced, yeah. Well, the interesting question. So when you say it's induced, it's, it's induced by the presence of a magnet. Is that so? So ordin in, an, in an ordinary conductor, um, you get the Hall effect. And what that is, is that when you put the conductor in a, in a magnet, um, then the, um, the electrons try to turn 
turn, and that gives you a voltage perpendicular. So that's called the Hall effect. And so the quantum Hall effect is a similar, um, a similar uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of thing um, where, where quantum mechanics makes this Hall voltage uh, have this quantized value. Now, but one point that I will make is that one of the things that, um, that we've recognized over the last you know, decade or so um, is that in order to get the quantum Hall effect, you actually don't need the magnetic field. Okay? And so, so it's possible to have the quantum Hall effect without the magnetic field. Now, you have to do something. Okay, and what you have to do is you have to um, you have to have some sort of magnetism or something in there, but you don't have to have a uniform uh, magnetic field. Okay, and so um, and and that fact actually is 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 again goes back to the inspiration of of um, of David Thales for recognizing that what you need is you need to have an electronic structure that has this non-trivial topological invariant, and you don't need to have the magnetic field in order to do that. OK, well, maybe that's the last question. Uh, in your superconducting example at the end, could the Cooper pair be recognized as a qubit? No, actually, um, it's not the Cooper pair that's the qubit. Um, uh, but it's related. It's more like half of a Cooper pair. So this, uh, this Majorana um, uh, uh, state, you see, an ordinary, an ordinary superconductor, basically, you can't add single electrons because there's, a energy, it's, there's an energy barrier to adding single electrons, where, whereas Cooper pairs go in for free. Okay? Now, what the Majorana state allows you to do is it allows you to add a single electron, which is like half of a Cooper pair. Okay, and, and, and whether or not that half of Cooper pair is there or not, that is related to what the, what the qubit is. Okay, and so, so there is a connection, a connection there, but it's not a Cooper pair, it's sort of like half of a Cooper pair. Yeah. Okay, with this, uh, I think this is, uh, this is enough. Thank okay. you very much for this uh, great, inspiring lecture. All right, thank you.